So welcome everybody, and um, I will give the word to Aslak, who will give us a nice presentation. And like times afterwards, we will have a, a 15 or 20 minutes uh, questions and answers. So please put your questions in the chests or in the Q and A, and we will then raise them uh, at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Sergey. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Aslak Stubskov. Uh, I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of uh, Coming Atomics. Uh, yeah, and I'll be talking a little bit today about um, waste burning of uh, spent nuclear fuel, uh, specifically in a thorium uh, molten salt reactor cycle. Um, and if you've been to some of our other um, uh, masterclass webinars uh, hosted uh, by Sergey and where uh, Thomas James presented, you've heard a lot about molten salt reactors and specifically also about thorium and why this particular image of a thorium ball is really important because a ball that size made out of thorium has enough energy to supply your entire uh, need of energy, not just electricity, throughout your entire lifetime. Um, and that's what's so significant about molten cell reactors is that there's such a huge potential to produce energy. So I'll, I'll go through some of these uh, details here. Um, uh, as you probably know already, uh, nuclear right now is a minority of the energy being produced in the world. And the majority of that is, of course, uh, coal, oil, and gas. Uh, and if we look at this pie throughout time, it doesn't really change a lot. Uh, but we really need some solution that, that can scale to uh, replace coal, oil, and gas. And some people are looking at renewables, and, and we're particularly looking at nuclear, because we think that that has a really unique advantage in order to be able to scale. Uh, and if we look at how it looks throughout time and in different regions, we see that there's no stopping of the growth in the short term. There's really a huge demand for energy globally and an increasing demand for energy. Uh, and we're soon to hit like the uh, 20, 20 terawatts um, power uh, consumption. Uh, and you wouldn't expect this um, increasing need for energy to stop anytime soon because the world population is still also increasing and will continue to increase until the end of the century, probably. Um, and so if we look at the growth of the different types of energy we have in the market, we see that the majority of the growth over the past century has been made by um, coal, oil and gas, so fossil fuels. And we're of course looking to the future to see if we have to replace these, what has the has the, the capacity and the, the ability to scale so that the vast majority of the in the future is made up by renewables and particularly nuclear. Um, and if we look at how uh, nuclear is traditionally done, uh, what we do now and have been do doing since uh, the 40s is dig uranium out of the ground. So if you can see my mouse, this is you take uranium from various sources for mining and, and, and from uh, in situ in the ground. And you take that and you convert it to uranium uh, uh, hexafluoride, which is a gas at room temperature. And you then take this gas and you run it through an enrichment plant. And what you do there is you just take the uranium composition that comes out of the ground. Uh, that has only a tiny amount that's fissile, U-235, 0.7%. And then you run it through enrichment plants that increase the percentage of the uranium-235, uh, which is the fissile that you can split in a reactor, um, so that you can have a, a critical reactor with a light water configuration. Um, so this requires a lot of uh, energy to do this enrichment process. Uh, and from that enriched fuel, you then produce uh, often uh, uranium oxides that you press into pellets and sinter and stack into fuel bundles and put into a reactor where you uh, burn some of the fuel to produce uh, spent fuel. Uh, and so what we'll see here in a bit is that the, it's only a small fraction of the fuel that you actually burn in this process. And for a long time, the holy grail has been to close this cycle by taking the spent fuel and then um, reprocessing it into new fuel. Uh, the, the reason that you can only burn a tiny fraction of the fuel is that the fission products from the nuclear reaction build up in the, in the ceramic fuel and uh, challenge the structural integrity of the fuel. So you can only uh, burn up so much of the fuel as we'll look at. And you then need to reprocess this spent fuel to put it back into a reactor. 
and there's some other complications, but mainly this process of reusing spent fuel is more expensive than just going through this whole conversion cycle from uh, natural uranium. So to this day, it's still economically more viable to just do this, what we call a once through cycle, where you only put the fuel in the reactor once and then you send it off for disposal. Um, and it's, it's more expensive to separate out the fuel and process and, and make new fuel. Uh, and that's in large part due to the way that you need to do fuel fabrication for traditional nuclear reactors. Um, another part of the picture is what is shown over here on the, the left. It is that when you enrich the fuel, uh, to increase the enrichment level from 0.7% to something like 4%, which is what most uh, light water reactors use, or even higher to something like 20-ish uh, percent, which is what most of the, um, uh, these uh, new small uh, micro reactors that people are looking at, or even up to 100 percent, which is, or 80 to 100, which is for weapons grade. It takes more and more energy to increase the enrichment, but it's not a linear increase. It takes exponentially more energy to get a higher enrichment level. And so this graph over here shows the what is called the separate uh, separative uh, work unit SW, like the amount of work you need to do to produce a certain quantity of enrichment level uh, from a certain amount of uh, natural uranium. And it just shows here some of the different numbers for how at different enrichment levels you need more and more energy to create a high enrichment. And this is also relevant uh, for some of the later topics, but also because most molten salt reactor uh, designs require higher enrichment than you do in a light water reactor, often around 20% rather than 5%. Um, if we then look at uh, the fuel that goes into the reactor, uh, if uh, here is an example where it's enriched to around 3%, so 3 to 5 for a classical uh, nuclear reactor, uh, and the vast majority is then still uranium-238, uh, uh, which is fertile, uh, meaning that it doesn't fission upon hitting a neutron, or at least the likelihood is low, but it results after decay into another fissile compound that can be fissioned into a reactor. And what you see in these lines here is then over time, as the fuel is being burned, um, the amount of uh, uh, fissile uranium up here in light blue gets decreased, and the amount of fertile uranium-235 also decreases, but this is only in a few percentages. And what you build up is these fission products uh, shown in gray. You also see that while you're building up plutonium in the fuel from absorption of neutron in the U-238, some of that plutonium is also being burned in a light water reactor. So you have both a little bit of conversion and consumption of both uh, of the plutonium and higher transuranics. But Again, after three years or so, you then have to take the fuel out of the core because it's now been uh, burned up to a degree where the integrity of the fuel pellet can be compromised if you keep, put it, uh, keep it uh, in the core. And so you get uh, a fraction of uh, still fissile uranium, uh, um, a few percentages of uh, fission products, and a small percentage of uh, plutonium. And if we look at the uh, plot here on the right. Of course, this is a, a double logarithmic plot, so those are always hard intuitively to sort of figure out. But what it shows here on the x-axis is a period of time in years, so 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. And on the y-axis, it shows uh, the toxicity in um, sieverts per ton of spent fuel. So basically, how radioactive is uh, a ton of spent fuel? And you see, when you pull it out of the reactor, because of these fission products and some of the plutonium, it's highly radioactive just when you pull it out. Uh, let's see if I can move here. This way. Um, but uh, over time, it slowly decays. And it's then a, uh, like a combination of both the plutonium and the uranium, uh, sorry, and the um, uranium and the fission products that makes up this, um, how radioactive that spent fuel is. Um, if we separate it out and then only look at the fission products, we see that after only a few hundred years, we actually get down to the radiation level of uranium ore. So that means that in principle, if you separate out the fission products only and store them for up to 300 years, they're at the same radiotoxicity as uranium ore, which you can find in soil. Uh, there's around one cubic centimeter of uranium in a cubic meter of gardening soil. Uh, the plot also shows if we don't have perfect separation and there's a little bit of the plutonium and transuranics, 
lift in the fission products, the amount of storage time is uh, increased a little bit. Um, of course, this is an exponential scale or um, logarithmic scale. Uh, but you, what we see here is that the vast majority of the long-lived uh, radioactivity comes from the plutonium and other transuranics in the fuel. And what, of course, would be the ideal solution here is to then separate out the plutonium and transuranics and keep them in a reactor to burn them up uh, and only be left with the fission products because then you have a waste stream that you only need to store for 300 years instead of thousands of years. Um, and this is achievable with molten salt reactors, as we will see later, because we have a liquid fuel where you can do chemical reprocessing much more economically than you can do with spent fuel from a traditional reactor where you have it as ceramics that you need to dissolve and make into a liquid state and do chemistry on and then produce new fuel from uh, the products of that chemistry. Um, if we look at some of the, the neutron physics of, uh, of uh, reactors, um, this graph here shows again exponential, uh, or sorry, logarithmic, double logarithmic scales. Um, the neutron energy, so the energy of the neutron that you have in this chain reaction in the reactor, uh, are created from the fissioning event with an energy around one mega electron volt. So that is what we call fast spectrum. So the neutron comes out with a roughly this energy. And what we then see on the y axis is the propensity for fission of an isotope that absorbs a neutron at a specific energy. So that means that the isotope in question that's fissile, the likelihood that that will fission is dependent upon the speed of the neutron that hits that isotope. And we see that the, um, the probability of creating fission in the fast spectrum where the neutrons are created from fission is fairly low compared to what we call thermal spectrum around one MeV or lower. Um, where if you look here, it's many orders of magnitude more likely to cause fission in a thermal spectrum. So most reactors, uh, which we call thermal reactors, are built on the idea that we take the fast neutrons from the chain reaction and we slow them down through collision with lighter atoms that doesn't absorb the neutrons to a energy where they're thermalized, meaning they have the same kinetic energy as uh, the thermal material, like the speed of the atoms in the moderator, and that this, this makes the probability of fission much higher. And the reason you would want to do this is that if you have much higher probability of fission, you also need much less fissile material, or in some circumstances, you need lower enrichment of that material. So most reactors are built around the idea that you take neutrons from the high uh, energy range and you slow them down to the thermal range where you have higher probability. And this graph just shows that the probability of plutonium uh, 239 is much higher also than uranium 235, which is the, the main fissile material in light water reactors. Um, a little bit more insightful graph is this uh, reproduction factor, um, because this shows the um, probability of uh, fission over the absorption, because when one of these nuclei absorbs a neutron, it can both decay uh, through uh, different uh, ways of uh, reactive decay, or it can fission. And you want the probability of fission to be large so that you don't lose neutrons to just absorption and the resulting nuclei just decaying to a different state. And uh, this is the ratio that's shown here, like the probability of fission over the probability of absorption. Um, and we then multiply this by the amount of neutrons that come out from this fission event, because nature just happened to be built such that there's more neutrons released from a fission event then is absorbed, the one is being absorbed. And on the average, two to 2.5, depending on different uh, isotopes is released. And this is very lucky for us because that means that we can build breeder reactors. Um, and what breeder reactors is that that's reactors where you produce more fissile material than you're consuming. And you can do this because more neutrons are being released than are being absorbed. But the amount of neutron that are being released, if you account for the sometimes absorption, uh, depends also upon the energy. And this is what this plot shows. It shows also the same energy before. The fast spectrum up here, the one MeV, and the thermal spectrum down here around uh, uh, one electron volt and below. And it then shows this uh, reproduction factor for the different uh, isotopes you see here uh, on the right. And you see some of the things we call fertile actually have a low probability of fissioning up here in fast spectrum, but it's very low compared 
um, to the others. Um, and if we want to produce more fuel than we consume, we need one neutron from the fission reaction to continue the chain reaction. We need another neutron to be absorbed by whatever fertile material we're going to produce fuel from to just get the same amount of fuel that we're consuming. And then the excess from that uh, amount of neutrons, we can then produce extra fuel with. And of course, it would be great if nature had made it so that we got three or four or five neutrons from a fission event, but it just happens to be so that we get barely enough with some of them. And especially uranium-235, we get are up here around uh, 2.23, depending on the energy, um, in the thermal spectrum. That means that we can both produce as much fuel as we need to keep the reaction going and a little bit of excess fuel. So over time, we can produce more fissile inventory than we're consuming. And that will allow us to start new reactors with that fissile material. But we'll get back to that point. We also see that with the uranium-235 and plutonium, they dip down below this critical uh, two mark here, which means that you can barely break even or sometimes you can't even produce the same amount of fuel that you're consuming. Uh, and that's not, of course not great if you wanna scale your reactor fleet to produce a huge fraction of the global energy demand. Um, so while we, we wanna take the spent fuel from existing nuclear reactors and burn them in reactors so you don't have to store it for thousands of years, you, we also have to realize that that doesn't give a lot of excess neutrons for breeding, but a thorium cycle where we take your thorium, your, uh, thorium um, 232 and allow it to absorb a neutron will allow us to produce uranium 233. This was, was also covered in the previous master classes. Um, and, and, and this is the idea of the thorium cycle is that you have thorium that you dig out of the ground. And unlike uranium, you don't have two isotopes. The vast minority of it is uranium-232. And that has the unique pro uh, capability that if it absorbs a neutron, it will become uh, thorium-233, decay into uh, protactinium-233, and then subsequently decay into uranium-233. So if you can remove these steps from the reactor so they don't absorb additional neutrons, when you get excess neutrons from your fission reactor, you can slow those neutrons down with a moderator and let thorium absorb the neutrons, all the excess neutrons, and you can produce more fuel than you consume. And this is something that's very unique to thorium that you can't do with any of the other fuels because as we saw in the previous slide, uranium-233 is the only one that has a well excess up here in the thermal range. Well, you might be tempted to then say, wait, wait these uh, reproduction factors, they look much better in the fast spectrum up here where the neutrons are created. Can we just build a reactor where we don't slow down the neutrons and then produce more fuel? And that's in principle true. You can utilize the better reproduction factor for fast spectrum reactors. But as we saw previously, the neutron absorption down in the fast spectrum is very, very low compared to the thermal spectrum. That means that the amount of fuel you need to combine to get a critical chain reaction going, it's much larger. It's orders of magnitude larger. And, and that is really uh, detrimental if we're trying to produce more fuel that we also need more fuel. Uh, so it becomes hard to quantify what, what is best here. How do we produce reactors that can scale to meet global energy demand? And we're proposing, and we're along with many others, that the thorium cycle is the right way to do this. And I wanna get back to that. Uh, but the cycle we're proposing is basically taking uh, the small amount of transuranics that's left from the spent fuel from traditional nuclear reactors, where you see they need a huge amount of uranium uh, mining and enrichment to produce a small amount of uh, fission products. Like if you, from one ton of fission products, you need to mine 250 tons of uranium. We want to take that um, uh, transuranics from existing uh, fuel out there and put that into what we call a waste burn reactor. Uh, which is a molten salt reactor that runs on the thorium cycle, but where the initial fuel is uh, uh, plutonium from uh, traditional uh, nuclear reactors. And the reason we want to do that is twofold. One is that there isn't a lot of uranium-233 in existence because it doesn't exist in nature. So the only uh, uranium-233 that exists has been produced previously in reactors. But there's a huge amount of transuranics. As I showed before, it doesn't breathe that well in a thermal spectrum, but there's a lot of this fuel. And what this allows is if we kickstart the reactor on plutonium, we can then use those neutrons uh, in the thorium cycle 
uh, to produce uranium-233. So that means while we start with a high amount of plutonium and no uranium-233, the excess neutrons from the fissioning of the plutonium goes toward breeding uranium-233 from the thorium that goes into the reactor. And because it's a liquid fuel and it has a huge amount of benefits that we covered in previous um, um, master classes and won't go too much in detail here, but basically the liquid fuel allows us to do uh, processing of the salt both while it's operational and also after we close down a reactor. And the reprocessing is also much cheaper to do because it's already a liquid fuel compared to solid fuel reactors. And so that means that we can basically burn up 100% of the fuel. We don't have to take out the fuel after it's only being consumed five or 3%. We can take it out uh, while it's operating and only take out the fission products. So that means that once a reactor has been operating for something like five years, part of the fission products has been pulled out during the operation and another part will be pulled out at a subsequent reprocessing step. And we can then only pull out the fission products. And if we look at what is the composition of those fission products, well, the mass majority is um, fission products that decay quickly and are stable within 10 years. So there's enough half-lives for the longer lives in this pool to be below the uran uh, uranium ore radiotoxicity after just 10 years. Then there's a smaller fraction that needs to be stored for these 300 years. But then this here is basically safe to be diluted into nature or put in a mine or utilized for many different applications, whether it be uh, space exploration, um, medical isotopes. Many of these isotopes, if you can reprocess them, you can actually use them for many different purposes. So they're by no means just a waste stream. You would probably have a small amount of transuranics and plutonium being pulled out of this chemical reprocessing step. And so whatever we can leach back out, we put into the next reactor again. So that means that all the transuranics and plutonium that we put into the reactor basically keeps staying in the reactor. And even if one reactor closes, that same fuel goes into a new reactor. Uh, and so there's basically no transuranics in the waste stream. It all stays in the reactor. Uh, and that allows us to run a, a thorium cycle that will start off not being a breeder properly, but over uh, years, it will turn into a majority thorium cycle. So um, what this will allow us is basically to scale uh, molten reactors to meet uh, global energy demand on a scale unprecedented by anything other than oil, gas, and, and uh, coal. And this is what we want to achieve. And here we take the plot from earlier and we sort of, Copenhagen Atomics projects the timeline out. What is one possible future? And uh, what the minimum we want to do is basically be able to scale much quicker than traditional nuclear has done or any other renewable uh, energy source has been able to do. And take the vast market share uh, of any new scaling and hopefully start eating into the uh, fossil fuel um, market. Um, and, and so you might ask a question, well, is this possible with molten solar reactors? What are the limiting factors? And we can do a quick back of the envelope calculation to sort of see what is actually the limiting factors for molten solar reactors to scale to meet global energy demand. Uh, and so some starting numbers here. In 2030, we're roughly projected to consume uh, 20 terawatts of energy. And that's not just electricity, that's total energy. Um, and um, well, we need fissile inventory to start these reactors. Uh, and we can look at what is the high fissile inventory. So fissile inventory that doesn't have a lot of fertile material in it, like low enriched uranium. What is the high fissile inventory in the world? Well, there's around a thousand tons of uh, weapons grade plutonium and uranium. But we are unlikely to be able to get our hands on this initially, you would expect that uh, the world would sort of see this technology flourish and be proven at a mass scale before you would allow dilution of weapons grade material into these reactors. But uh, thankfully, there's also a, a huge amount of uh, reactor grade plutonium. So that has a higher fertile uh, material content of uh, plutonium 240 and other isotopes that makes it unsuitable for weapons use but very great for starting nuclear reactors, especially thorium reactors. Um, and there's around 2,000 tons of this still left in spent fuel around the world, but this would need reprocessing to be able to be separated out and put inside molten reactors. 
but there's already around 500 tons of uh, separated reactor grade plutonium. So this is plutonium that's been separated from spent fuel and is lying around the world in storage in different uh, chemical forms, metal and oxides and, and other uh, salt forms even. Uh, and so if we had to figure out, like if we had to scale molten reactors quickly to meet global energy demand, it's probably most likely that we would be only able to uh, get our hands initially on these 500 tons of spent plutonium that's already been separated. So let's do a calculation where we say, how long would it take to reach 20% of the global energy demand just by 2030? That would of course increase over time. But 20% uh, of the 20 terawatts is four terawatts. So we can do a calculation where we say, how long would it take if we're given 500 tons of plutonium from spent fuel uh, to scale molten salt reactors to meet a four terawatt demand, which is only 20% of the global demand by 2030. Um, and there's some math here on the left that I won't go through, but I'll leave it here for you to see. Um, and basically what we assume now is that we can build reactors in an instant so that the production of reactors is not a limiting factor. The limiting factor is the design of the reactor. What, how good of a, a breeder reactor is this particular design? And there's two key parameters here. And the first is the specific power, which is how many megawatts of energy can you produce for every kilogram of fissile material you need to make a critical reactor? So as I talked about before, a fast reactor needs much more fissile material than a thermal reactor to become critical. So it also has to produce a lot more power to make up for that higher inventory. And so we can say for a particular sign, what is the amount of megawatt of power we can produce per kilogram of fissile material? Uh, the second uh, important quantity is the doubling time. And this is the amount of time that the reactor needs to produce enough fuel to start a new reactor. So if your reactor needs 50 kilograms or 1,000 kilograms of fissile inventory with a specific amount of breeding, how long will it take that reactor to produce an excess amount of fissile material to start a whole new reactor while the other one keeps running? And there's some math here in terms of how I, I, I do a simple calculation to get to the timeline that it would take. Uh, and I, I plot this over on the, here over on the right. And what we see on the x-axis is the doubling time we just talked about written in years. So a doubling time from zero, which is very improbable, all the way up to 50 years. Um, and on the y-axis, we then show here this um, specific power. So the amount of megawatts you can produce per a kilogram of fissile material shown down again from roughly zero up to around eight. Uh, and this color plot then shows, given 500 tons of plutonium, how long would it take for this whole fleet of reactor with that amount of starting material to breed enough flu fuel to reach a total capacity of four terawatt. And the color plot is then shown over here in, uh, in years. And there's some lines also indicating specific uh, uh, contours of a, a amount of years. So what we see here um, is 200 to one year. And this MSFR is a European concept of a fast uh, molten salt reactor that has been proposed and is still being worked on in research um, uh, regime. And you see with a fast reactor that has a great breeding ratio, but it has a huge fissile inventory need. Uh, that basically means that with that huge fissile inventory need, it, it's get put very low here on the chart. And you see it's almost close to 200 years. So while these reactors have a huge amount of neutronics char uh, characteristics that are beneficial, they are not great for scaling to meet global energy demand. Because if you give this reactor fleet of how many many uh, MSFRs you can build, uh, only 500 tons of plutonium, it will take them up to 200 years to meet the 20% demand of what we need in by 2030. So you see it doesn't scale well to meet global energy demand. And um, similarly, we can look at the um, molten salt breeder reactor concept from Oak Ridge from the 70s. Uh, and you see that's a thermal spectrum reactor that uses graphite. And that has a shorter doubling time and also better fissile inventory, uh, specific fiss uh, power. Uh, and so with this sort of design, you could roughly reach it in 30-ish years. But that's still a short, uh, um, a long time frame to be able to scale to meet 20% of the global energy demand in 10 years. Um, so if we want reactors to be able to really mass uh, take over the amount of um, uh, energy fraction that's coming from uh, coal, oil, and gas, we need to try and improve both the doubling time 
but specifically also the power, specific power. If we can get up here where we get into the 10 to two uh, to 20 years time frame to scale, now we now we start to see something. Uh, and this is what our company is all about: is how do we build reactors in a thermal spectrum? Because then we can get up here and we can scale reactors much quicker. Um, and we believe, at least, if we if we build reactors that is down in this range here, or not even breeder reactors, then molten salt reactors will just be a blip in the history of uh, energy production. We need something that can really scale here. Um, and you might ask, well, couldn't we just take that uranium out of the ground and enrich it like? they do uh, with traditional reactors. Um, and while you could do that, the, um, the problem is that then you need to scale enrichment many, many folds. And this is sort of the same type of calculation where I approximate, um, here I have the enrichment level that your reactor needs on the x-axis. Then on the y-axis, we, we have the amount of burn up you can have of the fuel per tons of uranium you need at starting material with a specific um, enrichment level uh, per year. Uh, and then uh, the reason the previous plot only had two numbers is because there's, these numbers are not very public for different reactor designs. So I could only plot these two uh, reactors previously. Here, there's a few different sources. We can have live water reactors um, and a few other, I'll get back to those. Uh, but I should explain, these, um, this burn up is basically how much of the fuel can you burn up per year with a given enrichment level? And the x-axis is how much fuel do you need, uh, or high, sorry, how much enrichment level do you need for the particular reactor design? And then again on the y-axis here, I'm showing how many times of the current enrichment capacity do you need in order to be able to produce four terawatts of energy, because the current enrichment capacity roughly covers the amount of nuclear energy we have now. So if you need to scale uh, molten salt reactors using enriched uranium. Then you also need to scale enrichment capacities manifold. And what we see here is depending on the different types of designs, you need somewhere from 10 to 100 multiples of the current enrichment capacities uh, to meet these global energy demands. And this is, while this is, uh, it's not to put any of these designs down, uh, using uh, enriched uranium is a great way to get early onto the market and start building molten cell reactors without some of the issues in terms of availability of plutonium. But the problem with them is that they don't allow us to scale to meet global energy demand. And that's why Copenhagen Atomics has been focusing on how to build uh, efficient breeder reactors. And I think you can start to see the picture here. Um, I can also plot the same thing instead of multiples of global, in, uh, global enrichment capacity. I can say one of these traditional uh, enrichment facilities here, I took the Urenco facility in the Netherlands has around 300 employees and has around 12% uh, of the global enrichment capacity. How many of these enrichment plants would you need to build to meet the demand of four terawatts? And you see, it, we need to build hundreds uh, of these plants in order to be able to scale global um, energy demand. Of course, you could start with uh, using a one through cycle of enriched uranium and then transition to another cycle. But it's just to show that it's not something that can scale to meet global energy demand because you would have these reactors on every street corner, uh, along with an enrichment reactor on every street corner. Um, so to sort of summarize here, if we compare a, a waste burner type design with traditional nuclear reactors, we need much less enrichment because we use thorium and we reprocess the fuel so we don't uh, so we don't do any other enrichment at all. So we don't need enrichment and we don't need as much mining. Uh, and the thorium mining that's in, uh, being done today is, is actually adequate to the amounts that we need. So we don't even need to scale mining. Uh, the amount of waste we produce is also much less be, because we can do this online reprocessing and because we can separate only the fission products and leave all the transuranics in the fuel, both the amount and the time frame that we need to store this fuel uh, spent uh, waste stream, it's much smaller. Uh, and then finally, the price is significantly smaller also and that's mainly because of the, all the benefits that comes with a molten salt reactor, which is high temperature, uh, low pressure, um, and basically uh, the ability to make small constructions. Uh, and then uh, the deployment speed, if we compare molten salt reactors to something like uh, the current reactors that's being built in Finland that has taken 17 years to get online, we can uh, build these on an assembly line 
And so the deployment speed is many folds faster than what traditional nuclear reactors have become. They were faster in the past and they could be faster again, but at, at least compared to how they, it is now, the current state. And then lastly, you can also get higher efficiencies in the electricity conversion because you have a higher temperature of your outlet fuel. Um, we can also compare um, a waste bur 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 burner type design to traditional or more traditional uh, once through uh, uranium uh, molten salt reactors in a thermal spectrum. Uh, and you see all the um, price and deployment speed and electricity efficiency is roughly the same. The difference is that because we can do this reprocessing and we can make breeder reactors, we have less mining and we still don't need enrichment and the amount of waste is less and the time frame that we need to store the waste is also less. So there's still some pretty substantial benefits uh, from molten salt reactors that use uh, go for breeding and use spent fuel compared to uranium uh, enrichment cycles. Yeah, so the reactor we built in Copenhagen Atomics, it's a 100 megawatt reactor that can fit inside the, a containment vessel the size of a 44 shipping container. And this is because we need to mass deploy this and we need to be able to build these on an assembly line. And so building smaller units that you can uh, transport and install with traditional uh, means so you can produce them at a central facility and ship them out to the site and install them uh, with additional equipment around of course but we can actually have the whole reactor unit inside of a 44 shipping container and the way we then reach this uh, uh, improvement in, uh, in breeding over uh, something like the graphite moderated reactors is that we want to use heavy water as the moderator uh, and the important thing here is that we want to use room temperature unpressurized heavy water so not like in a traditional nuclear reactor where you have highly pressurized water at above 300 degrees uh, C. This is 25-ish degree water uh, and completely unpressurized. Uh, and this is in there just to slow down the neutrons. And the advantage with using heavy water over graphite is that it's, it's a better moderator. It has better neutron economy. But also because it's a liquid, it doesn't suffer uh, radiation swelling like graphite does. So that means that we can reuse the moderator, uh, the heavy water again and again in, in, in sub uh, subsequent reactors. Uh, and with graphite, it swells and within four years, you need to replace it. Um, the disadvantage is that we then need special separation material to separate the fuel salt that is 700 degrees C on the hot side from the 25 degree water. So we need special barriers. So we have double uh, pipe barriers with insulation in between. Um, and, and those materials then have to be produced from something that does not absorb a lot of neutrons because that would ruin the neutron economy. Uh, but thankfully, there's uh, both silicon carbide and carbon composites that can be used for this purpose. So that's what we're planning to use. Uh, we might build test reactors short term that use stainless steel in the core material and simpler constructions, but long term, it's uh, using these composite materials. Um, and one of the key features about the safety of this reactor is that both the salt and the fuel side and the heavy water are basically uh, in tanks with holes at the bottom. So it always passively drains out the tank and then you actively pump it into this core configuration. That means that if the power breaks, um, I'm sorry, uh, falls out or if a pump breaks or if the, some control software fails, the pump stops and both the moderator and fuel drains out of the core. So there's no criticality left. They just drain out completely passively. No one has to do anything. And the salt would then have a fission product decay heat that you then passively remove from the structure uh, through this dump tank that's shown here at the bottom. There's a lot of other features here that I won't go into detail with here. Um, so the approach that we took is uh, to building these reactors instead of sort of designing the whole thing in CAD and convincing regulators to build something that you have never actually built before. Um, we chose a completely different route where we say, well, we're developing a completely new technologies. And if we just design it from scratch, likely when we build it, we would find many things that we would want to change because we, had, we wouldn't have had any experience with building it. And if you go through the regulators to start with, it's going to be a very expensive process. So because this is new technology, to move fast, what we need to do is basically develop everything from scratch, of course, using as many soft suppliers and existing components where we can. Uh, but basically iterate on the design without using uh, radioactive material because most of this is just engineering work and we can do this in Denmark without any approvals. So that's what we've been doing and we've been building many of 
different test systems for the last uh, five years. And now we're building sort of bigger systems that integrate all the different components that goes into a reactor. Uh, and the idea here is to build a one megawatt uh, demonstration reactor because the approval for one megawatt demonstration reactor is much easier than a power reactor. And we know that we'll learn a lot from building just a one megawatt reactor that we can then take into the design of a hundred megawatt commercial reactor. And so the time frame for doing this, uh, yeah, briefly, I should say that this is very similar to what they have been doing in the 60s when they invented and developed molten salt reactors. And they built many small different test systems. And one of the things they built was a test reactor of 2.5 megawatts. And they only operated it for a few weeks, but it was uh, in large parts of a success with a few to no failures or problems at all. Um, and you see here the size of a reactor is very tiny compared to traditional nuclear reactors. Uh, and the construction of these is also very simple. It's not uh, it's not like fusion reactors. This is just pipes and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, common materials, heat exchangers that these things are built out of. And of course, to get to this point, they also built many many loops. Um, and this is also what we've been doing. We've been building loops. We've been building pumps and different components that goes into the reactor. Um, and here you sort of see some of the different reactors and where they fit into the design. And so I was saying, the, the place we're at now in, uh, in Copenhagen, we're building all these systems uh, and we just expanded to uh, include some of the, the production facilities here at Alpha Level where we're located. And we also work together with them on the heat exchanger development. They have a really promising heat exchangers that we can use in these reactors. Um, and uh, yeah, the timeline for the next coming years is basically the path towards a 100 megawatt commercial reactor is uh, building a one megawatt demonstration reactor in, by 2025 first. And currently what our big focus is now is building the non-fission prototype. So that's all the same components, the same size, everything the same without the fissile fuel in there and operating and building that uh, and learning from those experience to then take that to regulators so that the approval process won't be us just handing over a stack of papers, but it's actually us being able to show the machine, show how it operates show what happens in different scenarios that you could think of, of how is this machine is going to respond to all kinds of different inputs. Um, and so that's the approach we have taken towards developing these molten salt reactors. And this will allow us to basically uh, mass produce these reactors um, and deploy them at scale. And so we actually have now something that can scale to meet global energy demand and suppress fossil fuels on a short term by using spent fuel and burning it in a molten salt reactors on a thorium cycle um, and producing prosperity for years to come, hopefully. So I think that's uh, my final slide. And I think we have uh, some time for questions.